and share my screen. Okay, got it. Well, good afternoon, everyone. While Margaret is uh, getting ready for her workshop, let me welcome all of you to the Reporting Qualitative Research Workshop, uh, the session conducted by Margaret Roller. I am Sue Bothman from ARL and delighted to, to see you and, and glad that you're here with us this afternoon. As you know, many of you have attended some of our other workshops. We began this series of qualitative research workshops and quantitative research workshops in the beginning of 2021. And it's hard to believe that we have reached the end of our series. Um, but as you know, uh, if you have attended these workshops, um, these are part of our research library impact framework initiative. And we've been delighted to have Margaret and Kevin Fomalot uh, work with us in presenting these, these sessions. So as is our practice, we are recording this session today and we will share the recording and other documentation like the slides with everyone following today's session. I know we have a number of people who want, would like to have the materials and weren't able to join us. So we'll be sure to get them to those colleagues as well. And again, um, as we practice this with all of our sessions, if you have colleagues who weren't able to be with us or colleagues in your library who might be interested in this information, please do share. Um, the materials. We're happy to have you do that. So with that, Margaret, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you for being here, all of you. Thank you, Margaret, for conducting our workshop today. Okay, great. It's good to be here. And um, thank you all for, for being here. Um, I'm looking forward to, to this workshop. The, um, as, um, as Sue said, the final workshop in, in our series. Uh, this one, as you know, is on reporting qualitative research. Earlier, we had uh, we went we had workshops on the in-depth uh, interview method, on the focus group method, and on analysis, and now on re reporting. Let me hang on. Here we go. Um, just as an overview, and well, let me say for any of you who were in earlier workshops of mine. Um, you're going to go, oh my gosh, she's going to talk about what is qualitative research again. And yes, I am. <laughs> and that's because um, I start every session I do anywhere about qualitative research about talking about what is qualitative research, because it is so important to understanding um, what it is we're going to talk about. In this case, we're going to talk about reporting. Um, so I am going to start there again, so it's going to look familiar. I'm going to briefly um, uh, talk about analysis because that's going to lead in very nicely to talk about reporting and, and kind of the overall goal, goals and components or sections of, of reporting. Um, and then uh, kind of most of our discussion will be a, a discussion about the, the uh, components or sections of the report and using examples from, from my own work. So what is qualitative research? And again, uh, for any of you who are in other workshops of mine, you have seen this slide before. Um, but I think it's important, I know it's important to remember what qualitative research is. It's not quantitative research. We are going beyond the obvious and the expedient and everything is about context and interconnections and how one question is related to another question and all about the interrelationships of what it is we're, we're talking to our participants about, they're talking to us about and our objectives. Uh, for what it's worth, you know, I started out as a quantitative researcher, um, but I very quickly, uh, when my head was full of survey research, I very quickly uh, wanted to become a researcher. And I knew that to be a researcher, that I needed to understand this thing called qualitative research. And that's when I kind of set out on my path of exploring qualitative research and just became passionate about it. Um, but uh, in, in doing so, what I also became passionate about is that uh, to to be a qualitative researcher, you need to um, um, embrace it on its own terms. 
not in quantitative terms or survey research terms, but in, in, in uh, the fact it is what it is and, and it is what you see there. And these 10 unique attributes, which again, if you've been in other workshops, you've seen this before, you've seen me highlight uh, what you see on the right there, the importance of context and meaning. Um, and I'm showing it to you again, and I'm having this discussion with you again, because um, these are central, these are central ideas and play a central role in, in how we report qualitative research. So as we go about the process of reporting qualitative research, I'm cur encouraging you to keep these, these central unique attributes, aspects of qualitative research in mind as you go about it, because you will need them. Um, analysis, in the analysis workshop, we talked, of course, about what? About these same kinds of ideas, about the underlying meaning of our data, about the contextual, what I call the contextual meaning of the words, not just the words themselves. Whether it be, you know, what does it really mean when someone talks about library support or service or impact, and how actually that can have a different meaning among different types of participants in different types of situations and for different types of, of objectives. So, you know, in a nutshell, and put more simply, um, the qualitative data and the analysis of qualitative of data is a kind of a nonlinear process that's focused on the latent, not just the manifest content, and is, is holistic. So needless to say, we're not, because we're not dealing with discrete bits of data, you know, our analysis doesn't follow a straight line from point A to point B. And these are the points that I, part of the, what I was talking about in the, uh, again, in the analysis workshop. And I bring it up now because it's in because this leads very nicely into talking about re the reporting of qualitative research. And as I stated in the, in the analysis workshop, and as I highlight here, the goal in our analysis is to construct a narrative um, from which themes and patterns can be identified and from which we can draw interpretations. In the analysis workshop, uh, we went through, I talked about kind of the eight, eight basic steps that uh, lead to identifying categories or what I called buckets, uh, as well as themes, and then drawing interpretations from the data. Now, it's these categories and themes <clears throat> that you've identified in your analysis that um, are going to be used to communicate your narrative um, as it relates to the research objectives. Now we've entered the realm of reporting qualitative research and the overall goals. And the overall goal, just as we talked about in the analysis workshop, is to communicate uh, a narrative. And importantly, and I think it's true in survey research too, but importantly, not to, not to report everything you heard. Um, and I'll talk about this again, but it's the idea that in your analysis and then now into your reporting, you're not there to regurgitate everything you've heard in your qualitative research, but to, to draw on the, the categories and themes that you derived in your analysis. Um, and to offer a, uh, convey a really rich understanding based on that analysis that really, um, really conveys, again, conveys um, human experiences, the attitudes and behavior as it relates, again, to your research objectives and questions. Um, needless to say, it should be, your reporting should be um, simple, user-friendly, um, convincing, but again, uh, um, but user-friendly and simple to use. So those are some basic goals. The basic components or sections um, of a qualitative research report, let me say from the get-go that this can be um, and should be thought of fairly with some flexibility. 
Okay. Well, let me say a couple of things here. First of all, um, okay. First of all, what I'm going to be talking about today, and when you look at these sections so that you know what I'm thinking, is that I'm talking about a text document, text reporting that's going to be used internally with your stakeholders. For instance, I'm not talking about writing a journal article. I'm not talking about writing a PowerPoint presentation of your research. Now, having said that, you could use any aspect of what I'm gonna talk about today for a PowerPoint presentation um, or for uh, obviously for a journal article. Uh, but what, where I'm coming from when we're, what I'm going to be talking about today uh, is in the context of an internal document for your stakeholders. So uh, um, the, these are the basic components of your report. Um, they, uh, this is fairly flexible because it will depend um, on your audience and what you need to convey and not convey and that kind of thing. And we'll talk about that. So for instance, I'm gonna talk in a minute about executive summary. Um, and I'll mention in a minute that, <laughs> that, that I, I don't always use an executive summary and you really need to think about your audience before you use an executive summary. Uh, going down the list there, the implications of recommendations, again, which I'll talk about uh, when I get to that part, uh, may really just be a summary. It may be, sometimes I call it opportunities. Sometimes I call it something else. So this is fairly flexible, again, depending on your, your audience and your particular situation. So the summary. I think it's very straightforward and I think you folks already know this, but um, my summaries are typically one to five pages, um, a paragraph on, on backgrounds and objectives, um, something pretty short on data collection, unfortunately. <laughs> And that's one reason I, I have sometimes I don't use executive summaries. Um, two or more paragraphs on findings, again, depending on objectives, size of study, your audience, that kind of thing. And then probably a paragraph that's um, summing it all up or is what I've called the implications and recommendations section. Um, you just really have to judge again, your audience as to whether or not you're even gonna have an executive summary. And what, what, what part of what I mean here is that when I have used an executive summary, I've been saddened to learn <laughs> that, it's not surprising, I know, but a little bit sad to learn that um, so some of my, um, clients or stakeholders or end users would read the executive summary and that's it. And that's all they would read. And um, that as a research person would get me very, very concerned. And I found that uh, if I could eliminate the summary or do it in some other way, um, that, um, that they would be forced to read the report and then they actually understood all of the nuances and had true of the research and had true appreciation of it of what it is we did in the research so and and, and how we got to the implications for recommendations that we did so background objectives um I just got one slide in here. This is one example from um, a study I did for Michigan State. It uh, conducted two asynchronous uh, online groups with uh, faculty concerning outreach and engagement. And um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I typically have, you know, the, it's typically just um, two, maybe three paragraphs with the first paragraph, being the background of, you know, why are we here and what are we doing and what's the, you know, and then the second paragraph talking about what it is, are the primary objectives um, and that kind of thing. And notice that at the end of that second paragraph, 
I've also stated that an objective was to understand participants' recommendation, recommendations for new approaches to outreach and engagement at, at MSU. So in other words, I'm including, I'm always including in this section of the report, um, um, something um, actionable that we hope is going to come out of this research. I think that's very, very important. I'm going to now start talking about research design, the next section of the report. Before I do, are there any questions? I'm just kind of going to stop here for a second and ask if there's any questions or... No? Okay. Okay, research design. Um, before I get into the intricacies of, of research design, let me just make this statement up front, which has to do, as you see, about transparency and the idea of providing sufficient details so that your users of the research and the readers of your report have enough information to determine for themselves whether or how the study parameters compare to or can be applied to similar, um, to similar contexts. Um, this might be sim and similar participants, similar places, locations, similar times, um, or that kind of thing. Um, it could be, you could be looking at how the study, the user of it could be looking at how the study is the same or different than earlier research with the same population group or the same segment of the population and you know how the results are the same or different. They might be looking at how the design itself might be used with other target segments of the population. So. The, again, the user, the reader of your research needs to have enough information to be able to judge for themselves whether or not they can make those judgments. And, and it's what I've, I've referred to the term transferability, which is the term we use in qualitative research, research to talk about the ability to transfer um, one, um, what's gone on in one um, study to another, the context of another, another study. Now, again, once again, you're going to have to judge for yourself um, how much transparency you um, can build into your report. Um, you know, tr uh, transparency is, is a sign of quality. It's a, it's a quality approach to your reporting to be transparent. But the practical nature is... Um, bottom line is that you have to judge your audience, you have to judge how much time and resources you have to provide that kind of information and how much of that information you can provide. And, and that's going to probably change for, for each of you. Now, if you're doing journal writing, of course, um, it, it's going to be, so, so that's probably one example. So if you're doing journal writing, that's going to be a different um, animal than if um, you're doing um, internal reporting for your stakeholders. So again, just have to judge your audience and how much, how transparent you can obviously be. I'm just encouraging you to be as transparent as possible. Okay, research design at the very most basic level is, is you're going to report on the what, how, when, and who. Um, and um, notice in the in the how and again he, this is the MSU study with um, the two groups of faculty. Um, you're going to talk about you know how you did the recruiting and who you recruited and oh yes we had two groups and one was we one was designated the high engagement group. These are faculty members who were highly engaged in outreach and engagement. Um, and then we had what we called the low engagement group. Um, be sure and include when you did this research um, and provide dates and who you did it with in terms of number of participants. And not only number of participants, I encourage you also to include um, um, who in, my, in this case, it was me, um, but whoever it is who developed the guide, who designed the research, who actually conducted the groups, did the analysis and the reporting and that kind of thing. Also notice that the very, very last thing I say on that you can see on this slide is 
that the discussion guide is in the appendix for reference. Um, so that should also be in there. And indeed, whatever guide uh, you've used, whether a moderator guide, interview guide, um, observation guide, uh, should be in the appendix to your report. Now, when reporting participants, when I, when I have, which has happened, and the, these are two examples from my work, um, when I have participants that are running across multiple segments, um, and, and I know that it is important to my client or the sponsor of the research that they see the breakdown of participants um, by these multiple seconds, uh, segments, I will put something like this in my report. The top uh, table matrix you see there is for an in-depth study, uh, in-depth interview study I did, it was 30 interviews. And I had, I very purposely, when I, when I recruited and conducted this research, I made sure I had a good mix of decision makers across different types of um, senior housing and healthcare communities um, in terms of type going, as you can see, going across in the columns, as well as the, the number of communities that these organizations um, um, had under their umbrella, so to speak. Um, th that was important to the client, to the sponsor, uh, it was important to me when I actually conducted the research to make sure I had that mix. So therefore, it was very important that I included in the report, which I did, uh, so that they could see how the 30 interviews broke out. The bottom uh, part of that screen you're looking at is a study I did with, um, uh, uh, a focus group study I did with, with um, consumers, and you can see uh, again, I had two cities and in each city I conducted two groups and they were very distinct groups in how and why they were, re were recruited. And um, again, it was important for the client that they see that we had this kind of mix. Um, so that's how I, how I did it. Now, what I've shown you um, thus far about this aspect of research design is pretty bare bones. And I, I get that, I understand that. Again, depending on your audience and depending on, on how much, if, if, if you have the opportunity is what I wanna say, if you have the opportunity to, to elaborate, um, on, let's say on your data collection, if you have the opportunity to elaborate on, let's say where you conducted the research or um, how it is you developed the guide the way you did, or other aspects of your participants, maybe going beyond demographics, for instance. Um, I highly encourage you to do so. And I would include in that analysis because analysis, there are a lot of users, readers of our qualitative research report that, and I'm not talking about journal articles now, I'm talking about internal stakeholders. And there's a bunch of them out there that really, you know, I don't know why, but they're not really keen on reading a lot about analysis. But the, to the extent that you can get away with it, I encourage you to include something about analysis. So for instance, including something about your data format. Did you have um, audio recordings or video recordings or transcripts? And if you had transcripts, um, who did the transcriptions? And did you have rules for the transcriptionist when that person did the transcriptions? Um, you might, um, and then what about the overall process and the steps that you went through and maybe even any steps that you may have skipped for whatever reasons, for some maybe very good reasons. Um, maybe something about the coders and how did you check for accuracy? Did you check for accuracy? Verification, did you do any verification? And I, if you can, and again, you know, this is not a journal article I'm talking about, but if you can also include something on uh, that, some reflections on the process, on the analysis. So for instance, you know, if you did have to skip any steps in the analysis process, 
what do you think, um, do you think that made any difference or had any impact on the analysis um, and on the outcomes of your analysis? So anything um, that you can add um, ab about any of these areas having to do with analysis is a good thing. But again, you have to judge your audience and you have to judge um, your resources to do so and, and that kind of thing. Do I have a question? Oh, okay, no problem. Thank you for coming, Charlotte. Oops. Okay, so let's talk about preface, um, which you know is kind of a cautionary statement. Um, and and I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of, uh, and, and again, this will partly depend on your audience. Um, my um, uh, users and readers of the research are often people who are very comfortable and well-versed in survey research, but not so much qualitative research. And I have um, many times in my career, I have included some kind of statement up front before I get to research findings um, so that they understand what it is they're going to be looking at and what it is we're going to be talking about when we get to research findings. So this is for a consumer study. I did you know, four uh, focus groups with consumers. And I'm simply here emphasizing the difference between qualitative and quantitative research, while it also emphasizing the contribution that, that qualitative makes to survey research. In this again, example, this is for GuideStar study, and I've used GuideStar before, and you're gonna hear, I'm, I, I use examples from this study um, kind of throughout um, our session today. But the GuideStar study is, is unique in that I conducted 86 interviews. That's a lot of interviews. Now, what's important here is that when I got to writing the preface, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I can already think of some people who are going to read this report. They're going to read, I conducted 86 interviews, and they're going to immediately start, start thinking of this as survey research. So I, I wanted and needed in my mind to do something to kind of head that off in the, at the past. So I really want to make sure that they understood what qualitative research is. And what I tried to do is, is um, kind of emphasize the unique attributes of qualitative research. Okay, let's talk about creating a narrative. This is, this is um, kind of the most important part of what we're gonna be talking about today. What you see here is, is um, the funnel approach to guide development. It, it, and if you were in, in either the in-depth interview workshop or the focus group method workshop, you have seen this funnel before. Um, and why am I bringing this up again? I'm bringing this up again because once again, I'm encouraging you to think about why we even um, conducted the interview or the discussion the way we did, going broad to narrow, gaining context and background uh, in the first few stages of our guide, so that when we got to stage four, we could use that information to, um, to help us understand uh, where the participants are coming from, their lived experiences as it relates to the research objectives based, uh, based on, within the context of their lives, which we've gained from the, the earlier stages. So, um, so I think it's critical to keep that in mind as you are building your narrative in your reporting. So what have I done here? I've kind of flipped it, tossed the funnel on its head. I've kind of flipped it on its head and now we're starting from the ground up. And we're starting from the ground up um, 
by giving the reader the kind of contextual foundational understanding um, that you learned in your interviews or your focus groups in the first few stages and using that to be the basis of your narrative um, as, you, as you go through your narrative, as your narrative um, unfolds. Um, because from there, you can discuss what you learned related to the relevant concepts and constructs uh, within that basic foundational understanding that is kind of holding this whole, holding this whole thing up. And then from there, you can talk from the, you can get to where you really want to go, which is to talk about the themes you derived from your analysis and that are relevant to the research objectives. It's kind of a logical interpretational narrative that you're giving your reader. So now you're, the themes that you're talking about around the research objectives are now being discussed within the foundational understanding and interpretations of the relevant concepts and constructs. I'm going to give you a, a couple of a few examples from my own work. Uh, one is going to be um, research I did for EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, one for an energy client, a pro provider of electricity, and GuideStar again. So Let's start with um, the EPA. And here I conducted uh, focus group discussions with their staff and with behavioral and social scientists um, concerning what they, what EPA want to know is EPA want to know what, what behavioral social science research was out there that would be compatible with EPA priorities. Okay, and uh, where I started in the narrative to set the groundwork, okay, so it goes the ground, we're, you know, starting from going from the ground up, where did I, what, where I started my narrative. So I started with, with having a discussion about the fact that staff and social scientists share the same attitudes. So let's just start there. They share the same attitudes. And one of, the, one of the things that they share in these attitudes is that, um, that behavioral and social science research impacts all areas of environmental policies, not just EPA priorities. In other words, they wouldn't be confined just to EPA priorities. From there, I talked about, had a discussion about the idea that just very logically, the idea that that behavior and social science research is thought about on a more profound scale where it's more comprehensive and it talks about, and these, these researchers were talking about more comprehensive concepts and think about more comprehensive concepts such as infrastructure and that kind of thing. And, and from there, that kind of set the stage for um, understanding their recommendations for EPA priorities on specific topics. So now when we got to the top of this pyramid, we understood that, that when they talked about more comprehensive um, uh, uh, ideas, such as, you know, how do we engage the public? Why isn't this their compliance? We, un we had a very good grounding and understanding of where that came from. Another example is the energy company I mentioned, um, provider of electricity. And here they were interested, the, the, the whole purpose of these focus groups, and there was a, a bunch of them, and the whole purpose was to understand customers' um, reactions to a green tariff idea, concept, which is basically uh, the idea of uh, charging, charging them a monthly fee which a, month, a monthly cost, which would go to renewable energy. So we started, I started my narrative by, uh, by making it clear that customers, uh, uh, so I started my narrative um, with a discussion of what customers, the, the customer's interest in the environment period. And what I learned is that it was 
lukewarm. I would say it was fairly lukewarm. There was some interest. Um, they did some recycling, but it was pretty, pretty lukewarm. They had some understanding and noticed, and they did notice uh, that some companies were better than others in helping the environment, but they had, um, they had noticed any energy companies that were helping the environment. Um, when we got to talking specifically about their energy use and specifically about their use of electricity, there was no awareness. And, um, it's, and in the narrative, it started to make sense because I just said they're kind of lukewarm in their interest about the environment. And now we talk about their electricity use. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not aware of it. I do know how much I pay though. They were very much aware of the bill. So when I asked very specifically about cons, about, um, about terms, terminology used in the green tariff cons, concept, um, they weren't, they couldn't define them for me. They weren't aware of them. They didn't know what I was talking about. Again, it was starting to all make sense as part of the narrative. So when we got to actually getting reactions to the concept itself, it was really no surprise that they couldn't really um, see a benefit to the concept and their, their only concern was that it was going to cost them money. So GuideStar is a, is a different animal and, and I understand that, but that's one reason I throw it out there because it is a different animal because it's 86 interviews. It was a lot of interviews. What and, 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 and what we are doing here is I was talking to I was talking to private foundations, public charities, corporate giving people, and and the main objective was to gain their reactions to um, concepts, to products and services that GuyStar was was thinking about investigating. Um, one of the things I learned right away in this research is that um, it was not useful to think about these 86 people I interviewed or, or these 86 organizations that I interviewed uh, in terms of private foundation, public charity, corporate giving, and those other groups that, that Gretzler had put them in. That didn't tell us very much. Um, because it didn't, because it didn't tell us what we really, it didn't tell us really how they were using GuideStar. By the way, GuideStar is like this, this massive provider of online uh, information on nonprofit organizations using primarily 990 tax information. Uh, so, so, but what was useful is in terms of thinking about how they think, is to is how they are actually using GuideStar, what kinds of information they are using from GuideStar and how they are using it. So one of the first things I did is I created user segments and I created three user segments based on how they were using um, GuideStar information. So that's where I started my narrative. My narrative started with here are the three need-based user segments. Um, that I identified. And then I described them, I defined them and described them in detail. From there, I went up and I talked about, I, from now, after I did that, I could talk about um, how each one of those user segments um, um, uh, finds advantages in using GuideStar, GuideStar, as well as other information providers. And then from there, we could talk about, which we did in the report, talk about user segments reactions to these various products um, and services that I, I asked them to react to. Um, so, uh, and by the time we got to that, it, it all made sense because they understood these user segments, they understood what they considered advantages of this information. So when we got to these reactions, it all, it all kind of um, made, made sense. Um, before I, I'm gonna just stop here again and ask if there's any questions. Cause I'm going to move from here to ways, things that we can do to kind of help discuss the narrative. Okay, all right, um, hang on. 
Okay, good. Okay, thanks, Nancy. All right. Uh, so here are just, I'm just gonna throw out a few ideas. And by the way, uh, I'm going to do this. And at the end, I'm gonna ask you for your ideas of things that you folks have done that you have found um, have worked well. Here are my ideas. The, here are things that I have done that I have found that have worked very well for, for um, the sponsors and users of my research. Uh, one is headlines. Um, meaning that the headline is actually explaining what it is I'm going to be talking about and is helping to tell the narrative. And actually, if you had just, just went through the report reading the headline, you could pretty much start reading a whole kind of understanding the narrative that I'm getting at throughout the whole report. But anyway, the, so the, the top example you see on the top of the screen is again, the, the EPA study. It's what I've already mentioned to you. I had one headline that says, as you can see, uh, more similarities and differences and just talks about how the EPA staff and um, the DC meeting just refers to the, the um, behavior and social scientists that I talked to in DC um, and how they uh, kind of uh, uh, think alike. And then I had another headline for another example of a headline of how their priorities transcend, go way beyond what uh, we what we wanted to talk about in these groups as far as EPA. You know, EPA had their own little set priorities, but as I mentioned earlier, the, the participants I talked to said, no, man, we need to go way beyond that. And they were all in agreement with that. The bottom part of your screen uh, is the energy study I just mentioned to you. And uh, again, I had one headline that just said, as you can see, energy companies could do more. Another one that said, you know, customers, electricity consumption, you know, it doesn't really uh, register. And um, as I mentioned that to you before, and you notice too how I used in that very bottom example where I says doesn't really register, um, is a quote. And indeed, uh, you can use quotes in headlines can be very effective. You have to think long and hard about what you're going to use, but it can be it can be very um, uh, effective. Uh, the top example, an example at the kind of top of the screen um, is again for GuideStar. And then the bottom of the screen is an example from a consumer study I did. Um, Again, you have to just be very thoughtful about what it is you're going to use. Which leads me nicely into this next slide, which says, yes, use quotes, but less is more. You know, using quotes can be very effective. And I'm, I'm a big, big fan of using quotes and moving your reader closer to your narrative and to the participant's actual experience. So that is what's really great about quotes. However, less is more. Um, you know, it may take more time and it will take more time. I'm telling you now, it will take more time to, uh, to understand what it is um, that you, what quote you want to use or, and to sift out what you don't want to use. But that is much preferred than um, giving your readers a long list of quotes. Um, that is not their job. Their job, the users and readers of your job of your research, it is not their job to sift through all your quotes and kind of figure out, you know, what is it should I be paying more attention to than something else? That is, you know, for better or worse, is your job. That is the job of, uh, part of the job of being the researcher on the study and doing the analysis and doing the reporting is to figure out what quote or quotes um, say what you need to say and then get out and then leave the rest behind. So the top example in this slide, again, is from the guide source study. I picked two, two quotes that I thought um, really captured what it is I was trying to say. The bottom part of that slide is the MSU study, the outreach and engagement study I mentioned to you um, earlier. And what I did here is I 
I was giving examples, quote examples um, on my, I was talking about land grant mission, the land grant mission of, of MSU. And uh, what I did here is I used just one quote for, if you remember, I did two group discussions, two, two group discussions with faculty. One was the um, high engagement group and one was the low engagement group. And uh, what I did is I picked one quote from the high engagement group and one quote from the low engagement group. You'll notice too at the bottom of the screen I used um, uh, for this MSU study, I used bold text and indeed bold text can be a, a very effective uh, way of um, kind of offsetting um, and highlighting important takeaways from your research um, as well as kind of supporting the headline to create to help tell your narrative. So it really helps that you've got you know, you've got, you've got your headline and then you've got this bold text and they complement each other. And it just kind of is reinforcing, helping to talk, helping to tell your narrative. Let's talk about language for a second. Um, um, I want to discourage you folks from, from stating something like, uh, which you know, I made up, this does not come from, from anybody I know, except my head. Uh, six out of nine faculty participants favor an open access um, publication model, or five out of 10 staff participants prefer working remotely. I really discourage you to use that kind of, um, um, that kind of structure to your sentences and, and that kind of, of um, talking in your, in your reporting for the reasons that I give here. It, it really flies in the face of what it means to conduct and analyze qualitative research. You know, it goes back to my, my early slide that I use over and over again, which is what is qualitative research? Go back there and go back to the unique attributes of qualitative research. And you realize that this really um, contradicts um, why we, uh, conducted qualitative research in the first place. It also, as I state here, it encourages your readers to think quantitatively. And what I worry about is not just think quantitatively about maybe that particular statement that you're making in the report, but maybe it flavors how they think about the entire report and the entire piece of research you did. So I, I would, I worry about that. And, and, and in a similar way, it encourages your, reader, uh, your readers to do the math. So, oh, okay, six out of nine faculty participants. Let me see, six out of nine, that's two thirds. Okay, so two thirds of the faculty participants favor an open access publication model. So there are other things that you can do. Uh, in terms of language, um, you know, here are just words, these are just words. I put in alphabetical order. They don't mean the order doesn't mean anything. These are just words that um, I often use in my reports, as you can see. And so the idea, so all I'm trying to convey here is there's there's non-numerical ways to convey a sense of degree when you want to convey a sense of degree of something. Okay. You can also do it with visualization. And here's an example from the GuideStar study again. Remember, I was asking participants to give me reactions to a whole bunch of products and services. And I thought, well, how am I going to do that? That just, you know, like they'll just get it. You know, they don't have to get, you know, I don't want any numbers or anything like that. I just want to get the essence of what I learned about the importance, the popularity of these um, products and services. And so I just came up with this very simple way of, of doing it. And it, it, it and I know from their reaction that it worked, that they immediately could tell what was the most popular and what was least popular. More examples of visualization. Um, here's another one. And this is from an, an energy study. This has nothing to do with uh, the green tariff concept I mentioned um, a minute ago. This had to do with attitudes towards the monthly bill. And what I wanted to convey here, again, I, this, I want to go, now how am I going to do this? I go, and this is what I came up with. 
and and here was my dilemma. It was how was I going? I came up with in my analysis. It's like, and and this I'm sure is true of you. It's true of me every single time. At some point, the light bulb goes on, and the light bulb went on, and I understood that what I had heard in my group discussions with customers of this energy client um, really revolved in some shape or form to this idea that electrical service is a cost of living expense, just like rent and food and health care and those kinds of things. That is how my participants were thinking about their use of electricity. Now, once I understood that, then everything else seemed to fall into place for me. Then I understood how that uh, attitude, belief, was influencing their attitudes towards um, their service and their utility bills uh, and their usage. So it was really fundamental to everything else. So again, I was thinking, well, what, how can I just convey that instead of a bunch of text? And this is how I did it. And again, I, I, I got the kind of feedback that says to me, it did the trick. Here's another example of visualization uh, for a bank client. Uh, I was talking to uh, CFOs at um, uh, private and public universities and colleges and wanted to convey, you know, board involvement, as you can see, board involvement with financial decisions. And just, it didn't need to be rocket science. I didn't need, it didn't require a lot of text. It simply required, I just needed to convey um, where they kind of fell um, in, um, in their involvement in financial decisions. And that's how I, I uh, depicted it. Now, this is also for a bank account client, but it's, uh, this is for senior housing and healthcare. This, what you're looking at here was extremely effective uh, for its, its, its purpose, um, which was to communicate the theme relationships. So I did, this was an in-depth interview study. I did a bunch of these interviews. And one of the themes I came up with had to do with relationships. Well, for goodness sake, if I went back to the client and said, well, guess what? Relationships is really important. They'd say, uh, yeah, we know that. Um, so what I did is I, I, what I did is what you see there. And I, what I'm showing them here is the theme relationships and then the four categories or buckets that make up relationships. So what is relationships? Relationships is ease of process. Relationships is resolving problems. Relationships is flexibility. Relationships is responsiveness. And as you see for each one, and then how do I say, and then, okay, well, I need to convey, you know, what does that mean? And you know, what does flexibility mean? So for each one, I uh, found a quote from a participant for each one that I felt really conveyed what is meant by that particular category as it's fitting under the theme of relationships. And so anyway, so that's what I put into my report. And I know for a fact that this provided actionable information for the client. Um, they just, they just, they got it. They just got it. And I'm happy they did because um, I was really, once again, wondering how am I going to convey, how was I going to do this that would be um, understandable and, and to the effect and, and, and be effective in creating some action on their part. And it worked, <clears throat> it worked. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to just end today by showing you just um, a few matrices. Now matrices, I know they're not, not too sexy. They're not too, well, I know, but um, they become uh, very important when, as I mentioned earlier, with respect to um, reporting participants, they be, it becomes really important when you have just a lot of information that you really do need to um, 
have in that report and, be, and because that is because it is key to the objective and so the client and your your sponsor is expecting it in this case uh, for an energy client, we are looking at news, uh, several, three or four different designs of a newsletter with customers, getting customers' reactions. Now, um, with, with three or four different designs and, and then asking them, you know, what do you like? What don't you like? How could this design be improved? As you can imagine, there was just, just a lot of a lot of information there that could have been very confusing, but to help tell the narrative and to stay on objective, uh, I created um, a matrix for each one of the um, newsletter designs. So in my analysis, so what I did to help tell the narrative about reactions to design, in my analysis, I came up with, with three themes that really governed uh, how people were reacting to these designs. It seemed to be, it's, the, the three themes seem to revolve around simplicity, simplicity, in other words, how simple the design looked, um, how, the degree to which it grabbed their attention, and the degree to which the information uh, was relevant to them. So using those three themes, I then, as you can see, I then uh, in my matrix said, okay, here's what they like about this particular design. This is design Y, this particular design across these three things. This is what they don't like so much. And then this is what they are suggesting for improvements. Here's the guide star study again. And um, here I wanted, again, reactions, as I've mentioned before, one of the, the important um, objectives to the study was gaining participants' reactions to a whole bunch of um, products and services that guide star might provide in the future. And what was important to me as the person who came up with, if you recall, these three user segments, for GuideStar based on this research uh, was that the users of this research understood reactions to each one of these ideas by the user segments. Because I had to, because there were different reactions and different, it wasn't the same for every user segment. In the, in the example I'm using that you see here on the screen, these actually were, I mean, this is not a great example in that, in that all the segments uh, preferred these, the ideas you see on the left, but I was able to say at the very bottom one for the annual report that all segments preferred um, the annual report, but it was especially preferable to what I call the prospect and, C, the, and CS segments, here two segments. But then I also need to convey why and why not it was perceived as useful. That's a lot of information. And importantly, and this is very important, importantly, um, it's a lot of information, but it's a lot of information that was key to satisfying the objective of the study. So it had to be in there. Another matrix for GuideStar, and this one was simply, um, um, this was about existing features of their website. And I was just asking, I was asking participants to give me suggestions how they could improve existing features such as their interface. Um, but again, another example, but again, um, um, a key objective to the research, it had to be in the report. At EPA study again, and here's just another example, a large amount of information. Um, and here I'm listing, you know, questions and issues associated with um, uh, each of the, uh, the EPA priorities, in this case, individual differences, behavior, and attitude change. Again, but this was key. This is what EPA expected me to come back with this. So here it is. Um, the last section before the appendix of the report is what I'm calling implications recommendations. Now, as I've already alluded to, well, first of all, 
it may not be implications and recommendations. It may be opportunities. It may be summary. It may be something else. Um, it may just be recommendations that you haven't discussed anywhere else. But important to keep in mind that there is, in qualitative research, there is no um, clear divide between everything you've talked about in your research findings and then when you get to this last section of the report, because believe me, um, you've probably already talked about the implications and maybe recommendations in the uh, findings, which is the body of the report. Um, so, so you need, you know, shouldn't go into the section, in other words, thinking that, you know, there, that there is this clear separation and divide, because indeed you may have, um, and you probably have, and I'm sure you have <laughs> um, already talked about um, many of the implications as you've gone through the research findings. Um, here's just an example of, of something I did for our architectural design firm. Um, again, this is the green tariff study. Um, and I'm simply highlighting the key areas that uh, they need to think about in developing the green tariff program. And here is, um, again, this is EPA. In this case, this is not EPA priorities that I'm looking at, but that you're looking at, but um, the scientists, right? This, this, the behavior and social scientists came up with their own priorities. Um, and that is what I talk about at the, um, the last section of the report. Okay, right. Here are some resources. How am I doing on time? Okay, uh, here's a couple of resources. On the uh, top is my blog, Research Design Review. Um, I put a link there with the tag reporting and that will simply take you to all my articles. Um, I've done a number of articles about reporting, qualitative reporting on, on my blog, including you'll see when you, if you do that, you'll also see that I have a comp, um, I did a year or so ago, a compilation of uh, articles related to transparency and reporting um, that you might wanna take a look at. Uh, on the left is our book. And, and the reason I put it there is because we talk about reporting in the book um, and we talk about transparency. So if you wanted to learn more about that, um, that might be a good source. And I also put the APA, um, the publication uh, manual, the seventh edition, which um, us qualitative, we're so excited that they have finally, for the first time, uh, have a section on reporting standards for um, qualitative research. Now, of course, they're talking about um, journal articles, but it's, it's well worth a read. I, I highly recommend it. Here's my contact information. I also have um, my office hours link there, if any of you would like to, um, uh, book up some office hours. I'd be happy to talk to you about any of this or any of the prior workshops we did or, or whatever it is you're working on. Speaking of which, um, do we have questions? And or <laughs> I'd love to hear about any of your experiences um, in reporting qualitative research. Any, any things that you've done in your reporting that has worked, you think, particularly well, or maybe not so well, I don't know. Hi, Margaret. This has been really, really useful. And um, I appreciate it. I was going to ask you about quotes, um, but uh, you put that in. And I loved what you said about don't make the reader sift through your quotes, that that's your job. So yeah, I, I hope you're okay with that, Nancy. I thought no, of you when I said- It was good, <laughs> it was wise words. And, um, you know, one of the things that we struggle with is, you know, those quotes are so rich and you become very attached to them. Yeah. And it's hard to, um, it's, it really is, and it can be hard to um, make them short. And um, 
I know. And, you know, and this is just the writing, you make it seem very straightforward and clear, but it's really hard. It's hard. It's really tough. You really- And, and it's you time really... consuming. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just going to- um, Maybe when you're doing it with a group, it's even harder because you have a lot of negotiation. Right. Um, uh, yes. So one of the things that I have learned is to, you know, set that out in the beginning. Um, like, okay, I'm going to write the first draft of the report as team lead, and then you all can weigh yes. in. Uh -huh. um, and make sure that it makes sense and agrees with what, you know, it, 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 it's correct or it, your perspective, you know, but, but it just, you can't be doing group writing um, or it will take you forever. Yes. Yes. I totally, I totally agree with that. And, and yes, it, it absolutely is time consuming and it's, it's just, and, 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 and here I'm going to say, oh, it's just about, you just have to block the time. And, and believe me, I understand how hard that is. Right. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions or anything you'd like to share? Margaret, I think you, you may have, in your presentation, you may have answered everyone's, or looking at two screens, um, answered everyone's questions. Uh, <laughs> we'll just give everyone another minute in case there are, sure. are some sure. questions for you. Sure. Make it sound easy, like Nancy said. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why there's office hours. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. yeah. Your, your, your years of experience and practice will come in handy. And I do, just to pick up on that, I do want to encourage uh, colleagues. I know several colleagues on this call have completed their uh, project or practice brief and submitted the report and it's actually been published uh, and others are beginning that writing process. Um, and I know we had some colleagues who were here on Tuesday for this workshop uh, are beginning their writing process. So I know their feedback was that this has been very helpful. Great, good, good. Any other last questions or comments from Margaret before we say goodbye? <laughs> well, with that, Margaret, thank you very much for thank you. Uh, offering this workshop and all of the workshops in the series um, that Pleasure. you did over, over the, past many months. Uh, yeah. We really appreciate it and appreciate all of our colleagues for attending the workshops uh, and being a part of these, these great thank discussions. You. Thank you very much. So thank you, everyone. Okay. Look forward to seeing you at future meetings for our teams. And uh, so stay tuned. We'll, we'll be in touch with some uh, plans for an end of initiative celebration. So thank great. you all for coming. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Now. Bye. Bye.